Today's guest is Bobby Hakkarainen. Here's our job talk with the journeyman carpenter. Welcome to the Job Talk podcast, where we talk with people who love their jobs. Our guests open up about their challenges, surprises, and secrets to success in their industries. Through conversation, we explore their careers, past work experiences, and the education that got them to where they are now. So I want to take you back to uh, when you were graduating from grade 12 uh, high school. I want to hear your story starting from the next day and then as you progressed to the career that you're into now. It would be a lie if I told you I graduated, though. So to all your millions of listeners, I'll say that I never really got past grade nine. And uh, they asked me not to come back to school. So uh, my dad, he, he, uh, he said, well, you're not going to sit on your hands. So uh, he said, you know, the academic school wasn't for me. So he uh, pushed me to go into trades. And at the time, there was a trades program, uh, an apprenticeship program for carpentry. And I did carpentry at uh, like woodwork and joinery at, in high school. And, uh, and I worked with my father on weekends growing up and made money. Uh, he was a contract framer. So uh, I took the, he sponsored me as a journeyman and I became his apprentice. Um, and I started going to KLO and I went there for two terms and I did them back to back. And, uh, and then I, with that program, you go to school for eight weeks and then the rest of the year you learn and then you go back to school for eight weeks and then you continue to learn and hopefully uh, you're doing different things for each year. At KLO, just for our listeners that don't know, that's in Kelowna. Yeah. Is it a trade, is it a trade school or is it? Yeah. Is it, yeah so there's okay. two, there's KL, there's the, there's the uh, Okanagan University and then there's the KLO campus. It's part of uh, Okanagan University. So I did my first two years there and then uh, I moved to Vancouver and uh, I did my last two years at BCIT. When you were doing your apprenticeship or the schooling at KLO, are you enjoying it? And do you find that it's coming easier to you, say, um, than when you're studying something that maybe you weren't interested in? Uh, No, I didn't like it at all. (laughs) Sorry, you didn't like it at all? No, no, I didn't like going to school at all. School wasn't wasn't for me. Uh, I'd never really succeeded in a classroom environment. But I knew that I needed to to get this diploma and so I buckled down and I did what I had to do to to get it and I've always struggled at school ever since I was like young and uh, so I think I yeah diagnosed with ADHD uh, in high school so that was a big benefit to know that it was a struggle for me and I was encouraged to ask for help which was maybe the greatest thing for me to learn was to ask for help was okay. So when I was going to trade school, I would ask for help. And uh, I excelled more at the demonstrations, the actual building portions of it, than, say, the academic portions of it. But I, to, to be honest, I didn't enjoy going to school at all. Did you continue to work for your dad um, after you received your ticket? No. Uh, so I only worked for him for the first two years. And then when I moved to Vancouver, I started doing a high rise construction. So I came here and there was there were, there was high rises going up everywhere. So um, on paper, yeah, my dad was my journeyman and signed for me to go to school every year. But I wasn't... Uh, learning under him and that's pretty that's pretty normal and actually the teachers and instructors would would also encourage you if because if you have one foreman and they're just doing interior finishing and that's all you're going to learn they encourage you to go out and 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 experience some other types of construction and there's so many types did you jump in with a fairly large uh company or was it a smaller firm you were working for uh, yeah, it was a big 
company, geez, we had a large site down on the waterfront in Vancouver, Coal Harbor, and geez, it must have been like 500, 500 guys there. Well, how nervous are you when you're walking up to your first construction gig, your first job? Are you nervous? What's your personality like, Bobby? Well, I'm uh, confident, but, you know, as a young man of, I think I was 20 or 19 years old, you know, it was, I was scared, but, you know, you're walking into a room full of men, you know, hard men. And when in construction, you know, there's a lot of these guys had gotten out of jail and you sit in the coffee room with them and you have lunch with them and uh, it's, they push you. And, but I think, you know, if you show up and you work hard, you know, you respect is earned and you had to earn respect. And one of your questions actually, I, uh, you said if I worked for my father again, and I did actually after that. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah, we did a, after I came down and worked high rise and uh, I did my first two year, my last two years of apprenticeship, uh, my father and I went to Japan and we built houses in Japan for a year. How do you find yourself in a situation where you can go experience Japan and build houses? Was that something your your dad had set up? Yeah. So I think my dad, you know, as any parent, I think well, most parents, they want to see their kids succeed. And I think, you know, parents, you know, especially when we get into our, when we start becoming young adults, you know, they keep an eye on us from a distance. And I think he was, he was keeping an eye on me and letting me grow, but he knew that I needed a jump. I needed some money to get going to invest in myself, invest in my career or whatever it was. So he lined up uh, a guy, uh, had a contract in Japan and he asked, he lined up a crew and he took me there. And I don't think my dad needed to go make money there. But what he wanted to do is he wanted to be a good parent. And what that was, was taking me there and maybe doing some more teaching and more some or give me some more skills, not only in construction, but life skills and give me a base of money that I could start, you know, investing. And you guys were in Japan for a full calendar year? No, not a full calendar year. Yeah. But yeah. Did you have a shot at picking up the language at all or? Yeah, I did enough to um, pick up some girls and find out where the local pub was. That sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's good experience. Was was it just you and your dad as the, like the Canadian crew or did he take there Take was, yeah, he took a couple other guys with us. No, one other guy, and there was two other guys there. So there was five of us living in a house there in Japan. And we would show up to uh, to a cul-de-sac, and it was just foundations, like 30 foundations. And it was, like, I'm from BC, and uh, there's a little town in British Columbia outside of Salmon Arm called Canoe. Uh, you may be familiar with it. And it, they, um, they may give a lumber mill there. And... In this cul-de-sac in Japan, there would be uh, containers dropped off and you'd open them up and all the lumber would be uh, stamped, you know, canoe BC. And uh, we'd just start, um, we'd start building. We built Canadian homes there. So 16 inches on center and yeah. Yeah. Is it much different? Um, the construction process in Japan than it is in Canada? Or were you guys doing kind of the same thing that you did in Canada, just in Japan? Yeah, exactly. We built Canadian homes there. I guess there was uh, some guy had built some Canadian style homes there and there was an earthquake and they lasted. And uh, yeah, they're much cheaper, much faster. We would build a house in like four days, two, three guys. I mean, they're smaller homes, obviously. I think they were like, I don't know, 1,800 square feet, 1,200 square feet. Yeah. And the lumber that's sent over to Japan, is it pristine? Uh, you know, yeah. I No, not pristine. No, it would be, you know, there was, there's a finger joint, which they call when they make a stud. It's not the full length and they just join the, the studs like this. There was some of that that came over. And you guys, from the ground up, you guys did everything with the construction of the homes? No, the foundations were there. So the concrete was put in. Yeah, it was just a little crawl space. Yeah. And everyone got along for the the time spent over in Japan? You had a good experience? No? No. (laughs) 
<laughs> we had to send a couple guys home. There was yeah. uh, some boozing going on, and you know, my father ran a pretty tight ship. And you know, especially when you're over, it was like camp life. And you know, you can't. You have to. You got to pull the line there, and you know, you have to. We all got to be going in the same direction, otherwise, it doesn't work. We were all there to make money. Okay. Um, but okay, you're there to make money, but you, you had an opportunity to experience the culture in Japan, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I did. And yeah. did, did, can you think of any memories of, of what stands out from your time in Japan when you weren't working? Yeah, we, uh, we took a weekend off and we went into Tokyo. So we took a train, we were in a small little, uh, village and uh, we took a train in and, you know, had a couple guys on the crew that were blonde. And we're on the train and they're, like, these trains are packed and you just see this blonde head sticking above the crowd. And these uh, white folks would come find us out and like, what are you doing here? And we'd be like, oh, yeah, we're going to Tokyo. And they would give us a bit of a where to go and stuff. So we saw we went to this station. I think it's Shibuya Station. And you may be familiar with it. You saw it on, you know. TikToks or Instagrams or something where like at the intersection, it's like 10,000 people. Two minutes later, 10,000 people like just changing and just had some great pictures there. And, you know, it was, it was the prime, like I was in really good shape, really young, really good shape. And it was hard. We worked, I think we did the first three months straight without a day off, 15 hour days. Like, I mean, I worked as hard as I'd probably ever worked in my life and it really made me into a man for sure what an experience that your your skill in life took you to japan to live for a year that's impressive yeah um, so you you spent you had your experience in japan um did you move back to vancouver british columbia yeah i did i came back and i was still pretty young i had an apartment here a buddy of mine sublet an apartment of mine i came back and um uh, came in and opened the key and sat down on the couch and turned on the TV and I was like, oh, it looks a little different in here. And then I made a, went and made a sandwich and, <laughs> and I was looking around, I'm sitting, I'm looking for the ball game on TV and I'm eating the sandwich and I'm like, I see like there's like the doily ducks on the wall and wallpaper. And I get up and I go, what the fuck is going on here? And uh, sorry if I snore. And I go, okay. in, the, I go in, the, in the bedroom and it's all women's clothes. And I realize he doesn't live here anymore. Oh, no. And I'm in somebody else's apartment. And oh. uh, so I slowly put the sandwich makings back <laughs> and uh, take my sandwich and I uh, lock the door and uh, leave. And I guess when I was gone, uh, he had been kicked out. So I had no place to live in Vancouver. So I moved back to uh, Armstrong and uh, I moved back with my parents. And uh, during that, I met my wife uh, back in Vernon, and uh, I started working with my father a little bit again, and then I decided to move back to the city. So I moved back to Vancouver uh, and started working high rise again, and it was it was good money. It was it was it was good money. So when, when you're working on a high rise, are you? Um, what are you doing? What what are your what is your job when you're working on a high rise? Is it drywall? What what's happening? So we would make it's pretty much form work. So we would create forms out of wood for the concrete to go into. The concrete gets poured. The next day we take the forms off, and then we put in some tables and make the deck. And then they pour concrete on the deck, and then we. Put those paint then we move up to the next floor and then we build the uh verticals vertical forms and fill them full of concrete strip them bring the tables up build another floor pour that floor and just so and it was a week on each floor so you know these high rises are 30 20 30 stories 40 stories so you're there and each it's like you know each 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 floor is about a week so you could imagine you're there for a year and that's when you get out of um, the parkade, which is probably the most grueling part of, of any uh, build, the dirtiest, the wettest. And it was, it was cold. It was cold, hard work because it doesn't snow here in Vancouver, but 
you get up high and you get wet and then the wind starts blowing and it's it's cold and it rains here for like six months straight so you know you have it's it's hard it's hard work and i got tired of it well i i don't want to hear any of your complaining about the temperature in vancouver british columbia <laughs> yeah i yeah I, I understand yeah seeing that i experience minus 30 celsius on a routine basis but... oh my goodness i couldn't so I want to get into um, what you're doing now, because um, I think you mentioned that that you work uh, in television and film. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. I don't want to fast forward too quickly um, into it, but um, so you, you did high rise work for a number of years. How t- talk about how you got into what you're doing now? Maybe. Okay. So I did high rise for geez, maybe ten years. And then I got into some residential work also. And uh, I wasn't I if I look back on it now, Kim, I think I was depressed. Yeah, and I was depressed for a few years. I was starting to have my kids were starting to be born and I didn't like what I was doing. Uh, I didn't I didn't enjoy it. Uh, it was too, it was hard for one. And I just, I don't know, I just didn't have the confidence that I could do anything else. And it was like, the money was good, but I just didn't have the confidence to go out and find something that really appealed to me. And so I took jobs, construction jobs, houses and some low rise residential townhouses and at that time there was a lot of uh, the leaky condos so I did a lot of that and then a friend of mine uh, told me that I should come work with him and he works in film and I was humming and hawing and I pushed it aside a few times but then I had another kid another child and I was like I need to I need to get going here and my wife at the time, uh, she uh, she loved me very deeply and she encouraged me. She knew I wasn't happy and she said, you should change what you're doing. So I took a chance on film and I've been there for 18 years. And it's the best job I've ever had in my life. And I love my job. It gives me so much. Uh, it gave me so much confidence and direction and uh, the people I was able to work with and meet uh, were so encouraging and intelligent and creative. And it's really gave me um, something to be proud of, a career to be proud of. Wow. I, we won't talk about uh, specifics as in like the name of the company that you work for, but uh, maybe we can talk about is it a large company that you work for? So I work for a production company, but in any a film worker in Vancouver works for the union, IATSE. So uh, it's the International Trades and Technicians Union. I don't even know what the acronym stands for, but yeah. I've been there 18 years. I've got all kinds of 15-year-old pins and 10-year 10 10 pins. Yeah. Awesome. But it's a huge union. It's got tens of thousands of, of technicians from GRIPS, Lighting, set decoration, makeup, hair, props, paint. And the biggest uh, branch of that union would be the construction part, okay. which I started in. Yeah. Um, there's so many questions I want to ask you about it. Um, I guess, could you tell us a little bit about your day-to-day work? And yeah, sure. Is that even possible or is every day different for it? I do pre-production. So they're based on 10 to 12 hour days. Production, when they're shooting, could be up to 18 hours a day, minimum 12 hour days. So I get to work, I usually go to the studio or where they're uh, the shop at seven o'clock and we'd finish at 5.30. And we have two 15 minute breaks and a half hour lunch in the middle there. Um, 
I remember the first day I showed up on my very first day and they were, uh, there's this old guy out front and he's like, I was like, hey, am I in the right place? He's like, oh yeah. And he says, go inside, there's some coffee and donuts and get yourself settled. And I was like, what the coffee and donuts? So, <laughs> you know, I was like, I knew I was in the right place. And then, but, um, so what we would, you know, we gather and there's a, there's a construction coordinator at the top. This is the construction department. Construction coordinator, maybe one or two foremen, and various leads. So when I started, I was just uh, I was just uh, a day call. So the union would dispatch me, and if they liked me, they would keep me. But you had to have so many days to get into the union. So it took me a while to get in. It took me about three years to get to become a member. And uh, once I did, um, I never looked back and. Uh, so I just started moving up. Uh, the first thing I did is I became an on-set carpenter. So they asked somebody, we need somebody to work on set tonight, which is a carpenter to, um, like, say, if if the set, like, one of the gags was somebody was smashing the door through the door with an axe, um, I, would, uh, I would have to be there to swap the doors out. So I worked on it, one of the local TV shows called Supernatural for five years on set. And those were long days, but I made a lot of money and I learned a lot. I learned everything about film, uh, different, all the different departments. And so I did that for five years, but it was really, really tough on my body, on my marriage, on my family. So I left that and I just became working back in pre-production. And then I became a lead and for a few years, and then I became a foreman, and then I was a coordinator for a few shows. And now, in the present moment, I've been on the show for five years, and I'm the location foreman. So that means that uh, I would go on locations. So I'm looking across the street at a school right now, and so if we were to shoot at this school, uh, maybe we do a couple scenes inside and they didn't want the classroom to be so big or they didn't want to see the chalkboards. The, uh, I would have to build, the designer would draw up something like, um, can we cover these uh, chalkboards up? I would uh, say sure and I'd tell him how we would do it and then I'd submit a budget for what it would cost and then he would say, oh, okay, can you make it cheaper or can we add this and submit another budget and then it would go to a final budget and then if it was approved we would go there the following week for that episode or and we'd have a couple days to prep it they would shoot it and then we would take it down and that just repeats itself over and over again can you talk about some of the specific uh films or television uh shows that you've worked on or is that highly confidential is it no okay. that's cool i'd love to thanks for asking what, kim what are <laughs> what are some of the highlights bobby i from would your say career? like i mean the highlight i what i love about my career is the people i work with like they're so awesome like everybody is just awesome and it's like you know i w- and it, sometimes i do hirings and um I, I i will choose somebody who has a good attitude over somebody who has skill. I mean, as we have to have so many people with skill, but I'd rather choose people with, with uh, great attitudes because we get put in positions that you're, you're together for weeks and months on end. So I did a show called The Interview once uh, with uh, Seth Rogen and um, James Franco. And I had the opportunity to, to be on set there, but also do some of the pre-production. And we did some really zany things like we had to it was in film like it was based in north korea and some of the sculptors made these giant like giant like as large as trees sculptures of uh kim jong il and these other um these other dictators and we had to put them downtown in robson square in these fountains and it's in, there's people everywhere walking around and we erected these giant sculptures and you, there was no mistaking. They were like North Korean, like 
killers and we're putting up sculptures of them and people would walk by and they'd be like what's going on here and me and my buddies we had nothing else to do so we would be like yeah i don't know we work for the city of vancouver and um uh, gregor robertson wants uh some more di diversification around the city so we they, these have been don't ask us but we have we're trying to put these up and people would lose their minds and just like like sitting back and watching you know, people's reactions to this and you know and i think when traveling all over for that show all over vancouver and the lower mainland and it was it was at such a rapid pace of setting things up and taking them down and i think the responsibility that was put on my shoulders was really was really cool and that's one thing about locations it's like um it films the next day and they pay us they pay the production crew six minutes in six minute intervals so if and it's like i don't know i'm guessing it's a hundred thousand dollars like um, every six minutes something like crazy like that so if i'm late or something that i build is not ready like we i'll get fired right so there's a lot of uh, str stress on me, but I kind of I kind of like enjoy that pressure. But it was fun. That show was particularly fun, and being on set and listening to Seth Rogen and and uh, I forget Adam Goldberg was one of his writers. They're both lo local guys here, and they uh, and just letting them like freestyle back and forth, like trying to throw lines to each other and. You got really... to witness that. Yeah. So, do you do you know them personally? Did you did you um, develop any kind of relationship with with those two? Well, no, I worked with Seth Rogen a couple times, but uh, on that show, it's we usually have a rap party. But on this show, he had a pre party, and he we went to Bimney's pub, and he was in the pub, and he was like he just bought drinks for everybody that was on the show, and he was just outside smoking weed, like. Uh, uh, in front of like the, the the corner store and this is like his old neighborhood and he's yeah. just like smoked weed for like four hours and i was like i don't really i didn't smoke weed too much at that point in my yeah. life and uh i was like fuck this man i'm going down and i'm gonna smoke a joint with seth rogan like i don't, I don't care so i just i just went and hung out had a couple puffs with him and he's yeah. just like super chill and then i yeah. was like i got too high and i i was like i'm gonna say something stupid so i went inside <laughs> i got paranoid <laughs> We did another show with him and Adam Goldberg. I don't know. That's kind of a story I have that, that's a bit fun. I'm sure there's a few dozen more over 18 years. There's lots of different stories, but that's a fun one. Are you surprised um, where your carpentry ticket has led you to, like, are there any surprises around with that? You're working on in film and television. Yeah. I Is that surprising to you? I'm surprised. Um, I'm surprised that I'm as successful as I am. You know, if I was to look back, I didn't think I'd make it this far. And I'm really successful. And in my personal life and financially and career-wise. And I think it's all due to having a positive attitude and, you know, listening. Listening and taking taking the opportunities when they were given to me and a lot of it is is like some courage some courage to put myself into areas that i was uncomfortable in and taking a chance to fail i think you know those those are some things that that got me where i am and hard work hard work and and taking some risks and knowing that you can fail and it's going to be okay. What do you love specifically about being, um, you know, in carpentry, working in film and television? I love, <laughs> I love, I love that I work with my hands. Yeah, I love like being a carpenter and that it keeps me in shape. And I love the men. I love the men. I really do like the people I'm surrounded with that I get to go to work with. And I love, I love how the men challenge each other. We challenge each other to be better 
and we support each other at the same time. And we're in tune to each other to know when we're having a bad day and we don't have it today. And I love like that we'll be on a project and it's like all our minds are on this project and we've put, you know, tens of thousands of dollars into it and, and, and thousands of man hours and somebody will walk in and go, we're not using that anymore. You can put that in the garbage. And we literally have to be like, okay. And they have a brand new direction for us to go into. And we have to be able to turn like a 90 degree turn in the middle of the day and forget well, all this love and passion we put into something and get that same passion and turn it around. And you can see some of the men are having a hard time coming to jump on board on this new project and to see guys support each other and, and, and say, Hey, you know, like, you know, forget about that. We got this and, and getting them, getting them started and getting them engaged in a small project until they're engaged in the full project. I like the inner workings of, of that. I love the dynamics of my crew. What, kind of advice could you give uh, a person that is considering getting their carpentry ticket before they even start? Like they're thinking about it. What kind of advice could you give to that, that person? Well, I would say um, your body is going to break down on you. If you go into construction, your body's going to break. Yeah. So you have in your 20s, you'll be lifting everything. And you need to not lift. You, you're, you're not invincible. Construction, you will lift shit you never thought you had to lift. And you will lift things that you have to lift because you'll die if you don't lift them. Because it'll crush you. You're going to be in spots where you're... You, you're you have, you, I almost died. I remember once when I was 20, I almost died. I almost fell off a building. And, you're, and there's been other points in my life where I've almost died. I could say probably three times in my career I, I've almost died or been paralyzed after I wouldn't be the same human. And that's going to happen to you working construction. And uh, especially if you want to be, if you want to excel at it or you want to, you know, like we work with machines that'll rip your arm off. You know, you'll lose fingers. You know, I work with guys, that, you know, like this, right? And, you know, you got to be careful. So I would, my advice is pace yourself and have a plan where if you're going to do, if you're going to learn and do, you know, there's a time where you can really make, you're going to need your body to advance yourself. But, you know, be careful with your body. Be really, really careful with your body. In your older career, when you get in your 40s or maybe your late 30s where you have the, the, the wisdom and you have the, the knowledge to start your own company and you can start to be a boss, you know, that's where you want to get to to preserve your body. Otherwise, your body's going to you're going to walk funny. You're not going to sleep right. Your back's going to hurt. You know, like you're gonna, your, body won't, your body's not meant to do this. Yeah. So stay in shape and you better be ready to work. Because if you don't work, you're going to get called out. And if you can't, if you can't work, then this is not for you. Construction's not for you. You won't, you, it's not for you. Go do something else. Construction is a, I think is a real something to really be proud of. Yeah. That is a great statement. Construction is something to be very proud of <laughs> yeah, totally especially carpentry you know like it's it's an honorable trade man i feel yeah. really proud about who i am like i'm 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 building something for my daughter i'm building a suite for my daughter and i'm building the kitchen and i'm drywalling the walls and you know i built a sauna you know my friends come to the sauna and like it's i'm really proud of what i can do and it gives me confidence as a human yeah. i did that and we need things like that in our life, things that we can be proud of. Makes us feel good. That is excellent advice. And you know what, Bobby? I've taken up a lot of your time today. We're going to leave it at that. So I yeah. just want to 
I want to thank you for uh, coming on this uh, very humble uh, b- podcast. I totally appreciate the time that you spent with us today. Thank you. Hi, no worries. Thanks, Kim. Good luck, kids. Eat your vitamins. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to the Job Talk podcast. For more information, please visit us at thejobtalk.com.